The political role of senator appeased, but only partially, Yeats's desire for some practical outlet for his energies. He had an excellent opportunity for political action when a bill was introduced to make divorce illegal. The issue was an important one. Catholic pressure for the bill was intense. An important cause was at stake. This is the post-Civil War uh, Ireland of the 20s and into the 30s. As we know, there are echoes uh, of it even still, but the echoes were very loud then. So he had, uh, by his stand uh, in the, after the Civil, Civil War, by uh, accepting nomination to the Senate, uh, he had clearly taken sides uh, with the winners in the Civil War. But now, uh, the clericalism of the winners uh, is so profoundly uncongenial to him that he has to break with them, as he does with his divorce speech in 1925. I think it is tragic that within three years of this country gaining its independence, we should be discussing a measure which a minority of this nation consider to be grossly oppressive. Uh, he made it clear that in his view, and I think he showed great foresight in this, that you will never win the North, as he put it, if you try and impose Catholic thinking on the life of the country. Uh, it was for that reason that he opposed the abolition of any possibility of getting divorce in the Senate in his speech in 1925. Uh, he felt very strongly that to have a united Ireland, you had to recognize the opinions of all, all the people of Ireland equally. Three years later, in 1928, Yeats was denouncing the proposed censorship bill as restricting literature and the freedom of expression. He fought the measure with great energy, but to no avail. Catholic conservatism won the day. Censorship of books was official, and Ireland's cultural life sank into stagnation. He felt humiliated by it. He felt that all the great uh, epic images that he had himself conjured into being for the benefit of a new state, that they were all being spat upon, that, that, uh, that the new Ireland was really a petty, bourgeois, Catholic, wretched little shopkeeping country. And he detested that Ireland. He despised it. He had a, he had a very high vision of this country and of its future, and uh, as some uh, as others did too, uh, it was a really horrible, uh, horrible letdown. And you see, um, we younger uh, writers, our reaction to it, not immediately, but later, was simply to leave it. Beckett left it, Louis McNeese, I left it, and they never came back. I stayed twenty years away. But of course it was a letdown, and uh, very sad, actually. The issue marked the parting of the ways between Yeats and the Irish establishment. He left the Senate a disillusioned man. saints and scholars uh, would have been all very fine, but who would have earned the bread? We were the last romantics, chose for theme, traditional sanctity and loveliness. Whatever's written in what poets name the book of the people, whatever most can bless the mind of man or elevate a rhyme, but all is changed. That high horse riderless, though mounted in that saddle, Homer rode where the swan drifts upon a darkening flood.
his intuition of the forces behind the events uh, shapes uh, much of his poetry, all his public poetry. And these intuitions were not, though he chose to make Ireland his base, uh, the intuitions are not related solely to Ireland. Ireland is very much in the foreground, but in the background are the forces that are moving towards uh, fascism and the Second World War. Turning and turning in the widening gyre, the falcon cannot hear the falconer. Things fall apart, the centre cannot hold. Mere anarchy is loosed upon the world, the blood-dimmed tide is loosed, and everywhere the ceremony of innocence is drowned. The best lack all conviction, while the worst are full of passionate intensity. Surely some revelation is at hand, surely the second coming is at hand. The second coming. Hardly are those words out when a vast image out of Spiritus Mundi troubles my sight. Somewhere in sands of the desert, a shape with lion body and the head of a man, a gaze blank and pitiless as the sun is moving its slow thighs, while all about it reel shadows of the indignant desert birds. The darkness drops again. But now I know that twenty centuries of stony sleep were vexed to nightmare by a rocking cradle. And what rough beast, its hour come round at last, slouches towards Bethlehem to be born. He is repeatedly attracted to fascism. He's attracted to it from the very beginning, uh, from Mussolini's march on Rome. Yeats saw, in Mussolini's spectacular new regime in Italy, personal government at its height, and a burst of powerful personality, such as he anticipated for a new era. Fortunately, he did not go so far as to accept fascism explicitly, but he came dangerously close. As a result of this perilous flirtation with authoritarianism, Yeats's political speeches of this period are not pleasant reading. Is it not possible, perhaps, that the stream has turned backward? and that a dozen generations to come will have for their task not the widening of liberty, but recovery from its errors. That they will set their hearts upon the building of authority, the restoration of discipline, the discovery of a life sufficiently heroic to live without opium dreams. He uh, addressed the uh, arts club in my father's presence on the uh, subject. He spoke, he got the name wrong. He spoke of that very great man, Missolonghi, referring, of course, to Byron's death place. And my father passed him a note, and Yeats looked at the note and uh, said, uh, Cruz O'Brien tells me that the name is not Missolonghi, but Mussolini. But does it really matter? No, he wasn't a fascist, like so many people in the 1930s. He dabbled a bit in the Italian version of fascism. Uh, I think he, like so many people, including Winston Churchill, he admired for a time Mussolini. He supported for a while a, a group in Ireland known as the Blue Shirts, who had a vaguely fascist ethos and a fascist salute. And for a few months he thought that he supported them, and then 